Good morning, so glad you could join us on this Sunday morning. Richard Orell here at Battlefield Assembly of God, the town of Battlefield, Missouri, just outside Springfield. Well, these are momentous days we live in, and uh, we hope that you are trusting God and, and uh, praying a lot. Um, most of us are, and so God still is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Amen. I uh, want to remind you, we do have uh, church again tonight at 5 p.m. here at Battlefield. And uh, so 10.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Sunday. And then Wednesday, now this Wednesday is a little bit different because this Wednesday is our annual congregational business meeting. And uh, it won't be a church service per se. But uh, if you're a part of the Battlefield Assembly, you're certainly welcome to attend. And if you're uh, part of the voting con constituency, if you have taken out membership here, then it's really your responsibility to be here if you can. I understand these are kind of strange days we got going here with the COVID thing. Uh, speaking of that, if, if you are homebound and you really cannot be here, please let me know. And we'll be happy to mail our annual reports to you, keep you in the know. God has been so good to us, we'd love to share that with you. So, <clears throat> let's worship God together. Uh, I have uh, three choruses this morning I'd like you to sing with me, and I suspect you'll know that, I hope you do. We have come into his house to do what? To worship him. Sing it with me. We have come to his house. Gathered in His name to worship Him. We have come to His house. Gathered in His name to worship Him. We have come to His house. Gathered in His name to worship Christ the Lord. So forget about yourself, concentrate on Him, worship Him. So forget about yourself, concentrate on Him, worship Him. So forget about yourself, concentrate on Him, worship Christ. Oh, yeah. 
worship real to each one of us. Thank you, sir. The book of Jeremiah, just absolutely dynamic. I mean, I just finished reading Isaiah, thinking that uh, I may have just read one of the greatest writers of all time. I believe I did. Uh, a silver-tongued orator and a writer, par excellence. And then along comes Jeremiah. How could it get any better? Well, when you get into chapter 2, Jeremiah just kind of picks you up by the lapels and shakes you around a little bit and uh, speaks very bluntly, very powerfully to the church. Um, I'm convinced that God wants the church to hear this message, this word. I've heard variations of this uh, from many other ministries. I've been thinking about it a lot myself. And uh, it may be that God is speaking to you. He certainly is to me. And so, uh, well, let's read it together. It's uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 4 down through verse 13. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, all you clans of the house of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and rifts, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. And therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coasts of Kittim and look, send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they're not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glory for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Perhaps a word of prayer would help. Thank you, Father, for your word. It is blunt and straightforward. And, um, and we need that today. Speak into our spirits in such a way that we will know that we've heard from God. I'm not really interested in hearing more meanderings of yet another preacher. We want to hear straight from your heart, Father. And so, preacher and congregation alike, we open ourselves to you, sweet Holy Spirit of God. Say what God the Father is thinking. Say what the Lord Jesus Christ is thinking. Get it into the depth of our spirit in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, I think it's important that we see immediately that this word is directed at my people. Verse 13, my people. So, <clears throat> these are the people chosen by God. Someone that he picked up when they were slaves and made them into a great nation. People chosen by God. People loved by the Lord. People provided for by the Lord like Nothing we've ever seen before or since. How he led them out of Egypt and through great peril, great danger, great lack, and he brought them out, not just barely bringing them out, but powerfully and as the champions that God's people are supposed to be. 
and his indictment rings against them. My people have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And secondly, they have dug their own cisterns, cisterns that are broken and can hold no water. Some time ago, several years ago, <clears throat> we decided to make some changes out of the farm where we live. And so one of those changes was that uh, we needed to close up, seal up, an old cistern that had been there a long, long time. Uh, previous families in days gone by had actually drunk water from that. There was an elaborate system from the roof of the old house that's no longer there, down uh, into the ground, through the ground, and into the top of the side of that cistern. And there was a time when the cistern was a good cistern that held water and the household used it and uh, did well with it. But by the time we came along, those days were long gone. And curious me, I wanted to see what it looked like. And so there was a concrete, a cement lid um, on that cistern. And it was uh, probably four feet wide or something like that. And the lid smaller than that. And so with some help, I wrestled it out of the way, just wanting to see, is there water in there? What's it like? in the cistern. Well, it was quite a hole in the ground and uh, rocked up around it. I couldn't see the bottom of it. And um, what I did see was that there's a lot of stuff in there you don't want in your drinking water. Uh, for instance, there was several, and I don't mean like two, there were five or more really big black snakes. Apparently it was a clan of black snakes that had uh, found their way in there somehow. It looked to be black snake proof. It was not. And so the black snakes had moved in. There were other things that were there. There were critters and varmints and bugs and dust and dirt and mud and whatnot. Nothing that really looked like something I want to be holding my drinking water. And that's the contrast that um, God seems to be putting before us as the church today. It's his people, my people, that he's speaking to. That we've, we've done two terrible things. One is we have forsaken him, the spring of living water, and we have decided to drink out of something like that cistern that I uncovered. I couldn't wait to go ahead and crush the thing and fill it with uh, rock and dirt and, and finish it off. It wasn't any longer something that I wanted to use. But just a few feet away from that is our source of wonderful, deep, cool, cold uh, spring water. It comes from 500 some odd feet down in the ground, a well. And truly it is wonderful, life-giving water. The contrast between the two is amazing, and that's the contrast I think God wants us to get today. If we, if we make anything or anybody else God, we have switched from drinking the deep uh, well water, uh, pure and clean and cold and satisfying, life-giving. We've switched from drinking that to drinking what might come from such a terrible place as that old cistern that works no more. So how exactly did Israel come to this terrible condition when God pronounces these two indictments against them? You have forsaken me and you've dug yourself cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water, hold a lot of stuff, but they don't hold water. Well, here is how they came to this place. You have to read uh, back up in, in front of verse 13 here. Go back up to verse 6. Number one, they did not ask, where is the Lord? This word, they, I hear about they pretty regularly as people say, well, they ought to do something or, or they should have known better. Well, they seems to me to be mostly us. Uh, it's God's people. And, and God's people didn't ask, where is the Lord? Where is the Lord exactly when? How about when the power was gone? When somebody uh, got up to say, thus saith the Lord, and, and it just didn't work. It didn't click. Nothing was happening. You didn't feel anything. You know, I, I hear and I understand and I know that, that there's some truth that you can't go by feelings, but feelings follow faith. And when you have faith, 
God provides the feelings. And when somebody would stand to declare, thus saith the Lord, and there was not a shred of power, no spark, no life, no drive, no fire, dead, dry, ho-hum prevailed, but nobody particularly cared anyway. They didn't ask, where is the Lord? When God's sacred name was replaced with other pseudo-sacred names intended to take its place. Well, it all means the same, said everyone. Perhaps they said the same thing. Well, it all means the same. All roads lead to God. I'm not sure about that at all. In fact, I'm quite sure that that is a lie hatched from hell. All roads do not lead to God. And it's important that when somebody is declaring some other name, Baal, Dagon, Molech, Chemosh, Baalzebub, Ashtaroth, how about the golden calf? How about the golden calves from Dan? The sun, moon, the stars. Well, how about if we'll just attach some name, any name, to God? It's just a more modern, more universally accepted way of referring to the same God. No, it is not. God is a person, and he has a name. They didn't ask. They didn't think about asking. It just never crossed their mind to ask, where is Jehovah? Where is Elohim? Where is El? Where is El Elyon? Where is El Shaddai? Where is El Olam? Where is the Lord God of Sabaoth? And why would you use some other name other than the names he has given of himself, descriptive of his nature and character? Secondly, the priests also did not ask. It wasn't just they, the people. The priest also did not ask, where is the Lord? When they were challenged by their own consciences, when they stood to declare, thus saith the Lord, and they felt nothing, when it was just going through the motions, when it was just another ceremonial thing to do, just another sacerdotal act, to accomplish. And they felt nothing. Why didn't they say, where is the Lord? There were times when we used to feel his presence. Why do we not feel it now? Had the people or the priests pulled the plug on the pseudo-religious ceremony at which they had become so accomplished? Had they called a halt on the bogus, God would have provided a genuine interchange with him. Number three, in verse eight, the researchers and the educators and the leaders did not know God. That's what it says. They did not know God. All they had were facts about him. There was no personal encounter. They had not run face up with the God of the Red Sea. The power that provided their escape from Egypt had itself escaped the leadership, the researchers, the educators, and the leadership of the nation. They did not know the God of the Red Sea. They did not know the personage of Sinai. They did not know the captain of the Lord's host at the Jordan River. They had no personal knowledge of he who brought down Jericho's fortress walls. They did not personally know because they had not encountered the one who demanded holiness at Ai. It made no difference what he was called to them. They didn't know him anyway. So it didn't matter if you call him Baal or Dagon or Ashtaroth or whomever you might call him. It's just another name. So of course it didn't matter to them. But it mattered to God because he is real. And he is a person. And he has a personality. And he has deep and personal feelings for you. He cares about you. Where you are and what you're going through matters to the Lord our God. They all rebelled, according to the word that I read here. They all rebelled against the God of heaven. But you know, the worst thing of all was the complete departure from all that was high and holy when the prophets began to prophesy Thus saith Baal. That was the worst of all. 
the priests more or less had the role of bringing the needs of the people to a high and holy God. The prophets, on the other hand, were tasked with hearing from God what his will and what his word are for today, for this moment. And when they began to interchange and switch names around, they began to prophesy in the name of this false god of the local region. And they coupled that with a wholesale rejection of Jehovah God, resulting in this scathing two-part indictment in verses 9 through 13. It's not just verse 13. We've got to read verse 9 and following. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I'll bring charges against your children's children. The suggestion is that it's not just our generation that needs to know God to make sure that we're talking to him on a personal level and a personal basis, but it's our children and our children's children and so on down the line because each generation is going to have to face this entity, the Lord God Almighty. Cross over to the coasts of Kenem and look. I hear pathos in this. I hear someone whose heart is broken. We're told in the New Testament to grieve not the Spirit of God. I sense that the Spirit of God is deeply and personally grieved as he gives this indictment. Cross over to the coast of Kenem and look. Senator Kedar and observe closely, see if there's ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Do they abandon these pseudo-false gods that they're worshiping? No, they don't. They are fiercely, personally loyal to that which is dead, cold, and dry and means nothing. You, God says to his people, you have me, live, real, personal, loving, caring, Father, and you've turned against me. Has a nation ever changed its gods, he says with a broken heart? Yet they're not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glory for worthless idols. And then verse 12, such strong language. Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror declares the Lord. And then that two-part indictment, they forsook me, the spring of living water, they carved out broken cisterns that can hold no water but hold a lot of other stuff that is not appropriate to drink. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 7.14 is the scripture we simply must use because it also addresses God's people if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Honestly, America, it has seemed for some time that our prayers have been ricocheting off the heavens, the heavens being brass and we not able we don't have the power to want a pop gun. I've heard that said around the Ozarks. It's a hillbilly phrase, but it just simply describes a powerless church. It's time for us to read this kind of stuff and accept it as an indictment. It's a time for us to say, okay, if God feels this way about us, what can we do about it? It's so simple. The, it, the formula is given here that we will humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. We don't like all that other stuff, but we don't want to turn from our wicked ways. But that's what God is saying. It's time for repentance, to acknowledge that the direction we're going is wrong, inappropriate, sin. And we have to turn around and head back to God, set our sails for heaven, re reject and turn away from the things of this world, and realize that time is short. I believe that. I mean, I hear that all the time. I even hear that from people that don't uh, really go to church much, and, and maybe they've kind of had it with organized religion, but they talk about Jesus may come soon. I sense that in my own spirit. There's an urgency about what is going on in the world. There's an urgency about what is going on in the church. My encouragement to you today is get in touch with God. He's real. He's personal. He's alive. And he loves you with an everlasting love. 
and he's not going to beat you up, and he's not looking for a way to keep you out of heaven. All he had to do was absolutely nothing. We had already chosen the wrong way. But he has made sure that there is a way because he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, how much greater could the love of God be that he would give his own son for us? Hallelujah. Would you just accept that fact? Just adjust to the fact that he loves you. Let me pray for you, and this will be our closing prayer. Our Father, I pray, Lord, for that one that is listening, and, and they haven't been sure for a long time where they stand with you. They have sensed their own shaky ground. Father, I thank you that you have given them today the formula to find their way back home to you. It's so simple to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked way. Those are the things we need to do. We set ourselves to do that, Lord. We want to be among those who hear from you on a regular basis. O oh, thou Lord God Almighty, we love and praise you and thank you so much for Jesus. His precious blood shed for us to wash us clean. Behold the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the earth, Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.